presentation in the projection system. Uh, we're going to use a whiteboard, and I've got some stickies. The, I've got like, you know, eight stickies here, which is either not enough content if I'm the only one talking, in which case I'll go home when I'm done and have a beer, or if you all are talking way too much and we won't fit it all in today. So I'm hoping that's what happens. Um, so I'm intending to lead a discussion um, and challenge some thinking and see where we go. Um, and uh, I'm totally okay with throwing all of these away and doing something else. So, um, towards that end, everyone come forward if you want to be involved in the discussion and an active participant. And if you don't want to be an active participant, you just want to watch or you're being sent here by your boss and you want to sneak out, go to the back where it's easier <laughs> to sneak out without anybody watching. <laughs> Take your big bowl, they're just fine. <laughs> there, are, there are four, or five, four good seats right here. That will be well, three. three. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> three and four. <laughs> there you go. So I figured I'd start with a little bit of code sample because I'm doing things on whiteboard, so code seems the obvious answer. Uh, so this is code sample zero. Um, I don't know why. So, um, so I want to talk about uh, some common code. This is something you might see everywhere, common use of blocks. So I've got a chunk of code that depends on some of my other code. Right? I want to test it without testing, without hitting all the other code. So in this case, um, this is sort of a top level function. It's going to call something which interprets some arguments, figure out what that's going to do. Then it's going to load a project. I don't know what that is, but it'll load a project using some loader object that it was given. Um, and then it will send some output based on the result of having this project do something for it. So, you know, common code like you might see somewhere. How would we test it? What it's supposed to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How do you want to use it? Yeah. So the purpose of this code is really just to um, sew together a number of, of already tested pieces of code. We've got some sort of a rule engine here that's already tested and it's doing things. It outputs, it, it gives me some object that I want to output. We've got some argument interpretation. All these parts are tested, but I don't have anything that actually strings them together into a working program. What's your coming from? There's more arcs. I didn't want to put the whole arc list because it was too long. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and this is very much pseudocode. It's, uh, you know, get the idea. But it's, it's, this is one of those many pieces of code that is stringing together several objects and trying to do a higher level thing using already well tested units. Yeah. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll buy, you mock all that stuff. All right, right. So you mock all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, you pass in interfaces like iLoader, and you give a, a, a mock for that one, and a mock for the next one, and there are seven different objects, I think, in this thing, and you mock them all out, um, and then your test looks very fun. Yeah, so. <laughs> all right. 20 lines of setup code. That's 20 lines of setup code, and not much yeah, You use the framework to generate all. <laughs> yeah. Well, it kind of depends on, on, your, on your approach, depending on yeah, depending on how you put things together, you can just mock out the things at the edges, and you, and you can use concretes for things that aren't. Yeah, so you could, you could do that. That's certainly another option, at which point you're duplicating coverage, because I've, got, I've already got code on, I don't know, this, this outputter. I mocked it down below when it's going to the file system or the console or wherever it's sending the output, but I, this test, the test for this code would then be duplicate with the code, the test that's directly for send. So advantages and disadvantages to doing that. When I want to make a refactoring, or when I want to make a feature change, I now have to update two sets of tests that are locked in the behavior. Arguably, you just kill the other test. Or I could kill the other test, but then I lose coverage because I, I'm not going to fully test all behaviors of send through this thing. Um, if I do that, and try and do that on two things at once, I get combinatorial complexity and life gets hell. Right. <laughs> so that's that's why we go with the unit testing to avoid the combinatorial complexity. So we're we're in a jam basically here. There's there's a number of options. None of them feel great. One of the, one of the things I've noticed though, with, uh, even with doing uh, data transformations from one to another, if you have data that's fairly complex and it, you end up if you're not, I mean if you're using just data functions, you're going to run into because 
we'll do unit tests and send the computable complexity down <coughs> deep in the data. But at the higher level, you want some set of data that's coming out of it. That you'll have to yeah. that you know, This is a valid this data state. Valid thing. You know, so you can either pick pieces out of it and test it on and test that, or just kind of test value of all of them. And so a similar thing happens here in the uh, yeah. So any way of decomp decomposing, you can you can have an edge where there's some duplication. Right. Um, and the higher the degree of coupling, the more duplication will tend to show up at that at that edge. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm not going to provide any solution today that is perfect. Okay. <laughs> right. Your sample code, though. So having set of arguments is code small to begin with, and then oh. I'm seeing. You're creating command equals that. You're not using command ever again. And then you've got project files, loader, load project, and then you're just passing in project files. So it seems like the loader is not necessary in here. So there's an SMP violation. That's five points. The professor is like great things. Um, okay. And then still, so if I have that, why not pull some of those out? Why not pass these? It seems like load project there cares about the project name, not command dot project name. Why not grab the command, have that be its own thing? load the projects maybe here and then evaluate the rules and what's that do? I feel like you're, you're just, you're doing a lot of stuff here. Exactly. And it's, it's not and good. I, that's the smell. Exactly. And that's, that's the smell. Mm -hmm. Knowing, being able to identify those smells is a nuanced thing. It takes a fairly high degree of skill. However, being able to look at this thing and say, how would I test it? I would have to use mocks and I'd have to use a lot of them to substitute in a bunch of different things. That's really easy to notice. Oh, yeah. It's telling me the same design code. problem. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so when I talk about mocks as a code smell, that's exactly what I'm meaning, is that there are a bunch of very nuanced, the actual smells are a bunch of very nuanced different things. Um, but anything that I have to test with mocks, one of those is in play. Well, probably several of those are in play. Um, so it's a very simple to smell, to detect smell that will tell me to look for deeper. Well, I can test those with, with fakes or even stubs fairly trivially just in general. And I can, that's the other thing, code simple like that, I can just test via inspection maybe as well, or just let an integration test deal with that. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, since there's no yeah. conditions, if I made a little, mm -hmm. if I put a couple of conditionals in there, now I want to test it again. Yeah, and mocks and on smell that, those fakes. Mocks on that test are code smell, just why? Why are you mocking those things? Yeah, so I am, when I'm talking about mocks here, assume I'm talking about test doubles. Okay. The, the general term, a fake of some sort. Um, so yeah, certainly if I'm doing behavioral mocking, that's way overkill. Right? Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but I don't have to do that for, for most of this stuff. Even, even having to pass in this many doubles and fakes to test something, um, it's indicating that there's a problem. And yes, you've identified several of them. So, so um, what are the other ways that I can solve some of these problems? You know, he, he talked about a couple of them. So one of them is, um, this is a very common pattern that I see all over the place. Here, rather than passing in what my system needs, I pass in some data and a thing that my system can ask to get what it needs. Why? Yeah. Just pass in what you need, right? Um, so, similar, to, you know, a completely different set of code. How many people have seen code that does if configuration dot get value blah? Yeah. How many people have seen that? Yeah, you've know, seen it all over the place. Okay. Well, How do you test it? Or refactoring? <laughs> well, is there a difference? Is there a difference between testing and refactoring? Yeah. Is there a difference? Yeah. What? Well, one has to do with verifying that the software does what it's supposed to do and doesn't do what it's not supposed to do, and the other improves the structure of design internal to the program without changing its input or output specifications. So if I look historically, then testing historically is about, yeah, prove it. does the system do what it's supposed to do, proving it or sensing it, or one or two. If I look at the TDD movement and that sort of thing, Test-driven development is, I would argue, one of the most poorly named practices around. Um, it's a design technique and a wrecking technique. And but you asked the question whether there's a difference between testing and yeah, yeah. So, so between TDD and refactoring, 
And so, so what I'm talking here about testing, what I'm talking about is, is the mechanism whereby we're proving correctness. As we, you know, with, with developers moving more and more towards proving correctness as part of their jobs, that's one of the things that we want to release more frequently, how do we do that? Well, we stopped building bugs. The way we do that is we have developers in charge of responsibility, or having responsibility for correctness. Um, and how do they ensure that when they can deliver code, they deliver both the code and proof that the code is good? And it got less. <laughs> That's one way, and it works, right? But it works, it works on a very limited set of problems, and it can be very expensive. <laughs> um, there are teams for which it's appropriate. Um, however, there's a cheaper solution most of the time. <laughs> um, and that is developer written tests. Um, and we call them tests. They are evidence of the, that the code behaves as it's supposed to go. Um, but we are, we've learned over time that the real value isn't just the proof. The real value is the, the feedback that it gives you on your design. And so as you start to work with developer written tests more and more, you're getting feedback on, does my system work? Okay, useful. You're also getting feedback on how tough is my system to decompose? Because I want to unit test it, not just test it, but test it in isolation. How do I test it in isolation? I decompose and I pull out one chunk. So how hard is it to do that? And that is a direct measurement of the degree of coupling of the system. Suddenly my tests are giving me design feedback. Okay. Also, I want to test uh, behaviors that the user cares about. I again would like to unit test those. So something the user cares about, I would like to be present in a single unit. What's that called? It's cohesion. Right? So if I can write a test that is a unit test, it tests only one thing, and actually tests a business verified or you know a business value feature, that I can only attain by having a very, very high degree of cohesion. So I can say this requirement is located right there in that piece of code. And nowhere else. <laughs> Um, so, so you're not making a distinction between a design bug and what you might call a coding error. No, no. I think it's radically bug. different. I'm just making a statement. Yeah. So, how many bugs? How many bugs does your team create? All of them. In general. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. So, come for unit time. How many bugs does your team write? It's a function of how many lines of code they write in general. Uh, but that has nothing to do with design bug, which it I does. said was a separate issue. It does. Traditionally, yeah. traditionally, it is a function of lines of, of code. So, um, standard industry numbers. Anyone happen to know them off the top of their head? Okay. So, um, standard typical developer produces uh, 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 what is it? it's two lines of code per day, uh, complete lines of code per day. If you take the entire project. Divided by the number of man hours put in, two lines of code per day. Uh, okay, that's that's the average, um, and one and a half bugs per line of code. <laughs> so three bugs per day, two lines of code per day. That's industry average, I mean, and that is what people typically do. Okay, go to an extreme programming shop that is doing TDD pair programming um, and, uh, and and refactoring. And how much do they do? Same how many bugs because they catch them in there and then desk. So I'll define so I define a bug as anything that ever makes it to source control. Like if you check it in, it's a bug. If if you make a mistake and you catch it and you never check it in, it's not a bug. If you catch it the moment after you check it in, it's a bug. It doesn't matter who catches it, right? But it's if it ever makes it to source control. Is that that's the number that the IEEE is using. So I may use the same thing for the XPT, right? So what do, what do those teams get? Do their tests count as lines of code? <laughs> I count them either way. So the number that I find from, from polling a bunch of teams is those teams are typically right around one bug written per eight developers per fortnight. I use fortnight because that's about the right granularity, plus or minus a little bit. So that means traditional teams write 240-ish times as many bugs as I can teams. When you're writing 240 times as many bugs, you need to distinguish design bugs from coding bugs from whatever else. When I'm introducing one bug per team per fortnight, I call it the bug, and I don't care where it came from, I'm going to make sure it never happens again. Right? I can afford to root cause analysis everything. I don't need to cluster them up. I can say, this was the bug for this one bug. Where did it come from? What caused it? Let's prevent that from ever happening again. 
So I don't need to distinguish and make categories. That is an advanced technique. This is not a talk that is targeting people who are just getting started on Instagram. Right? <laughs> um, for those people, use mocks. Great, they help. In fact, I'll talk a little bit later about some of the places where you really want to use mocks. And getting started is one of those cases. Um, but when you when you have gotten your defect injection right now, when you really are writing codes at one per team per fortnight, you're writing bugs at one per team per fortnight, then um, you have a lot more, you know, a lot more ability to pay attention to the specific cases and not trying to generalize. Um, and that then makes design feedback just as valuable as any other. So, um, so yeah, we, we had some ideas for how to improve improve this code. Yep. So you're <coughs> make sure I understand the premise. You're you're saying that. Uh, Use a phrase from from last time. It's part of the diagnostic pain here, all pain is diagnostic. <laughs> is that we've got too many mocks, and the example we did with the square bracket here is by pulling out the command object, and we really, we really just want to know project name. Pull that out into something else. Unit test that and pass in project name. That gets rid of one mock. Either project name or a command struct that has a project name. Sure. Either way. Yeah, that gets rid of one. Now, are you saying we could get to? Do you literally mean zero, or yes. you just mean few enough? Zero. Okay, I don't see how we get past the loader. We'll have to make more significant design changes. Yeah. <laughs> Is that the rest of your talk? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, so, so um, the, the key thing, you know, when, when we're learning OO and we're first learning to put units in, um, there are a couple of core techniques that really do work for solving a tremendous number of problems. Um, and MOX is one of those. Um, but inheritance, very general tool. You can just all over the place, right? Um, making a call on it, yeah, please don't, but you can, that's great. Right? And at one point in, in your, your progression of learning, it is the right tool for the job for every, for every job. Great, do it. You'll change that code. Um, the same is true for uh, making method calls through an interface and passing around interfaces. And a bunch of these techniques are very general and they work everywhere. Great, do them. They will help you learn how to build units and how to decompose things into units. Some of the techniques that I'm going to talk about, they're all a very special case. Um, so one of the ones that we'll talk about, that I'll that I'll mention is um, so making a method call here is a fairly. Did I just hear you yes. say that we shouldn't use interfaces and not do inheritance? Much of the time. Well, well I agree with much of the time. I'm yeah. not saying every I'm tool, not saying it's not overused. Every tool has every tool has its purpose. There are some tools that are more general and more generally applicable than other tools. Those ones are really great when learning and go ahead and use them everywhere. And a place that a lot of people get stuck is they continue to use them everywhere. There's often a better tool for the job. And it often requires more finesse and more understanding to use the better tools. Okay. Just like patterns, when you first don't know about patterns, you're using patterns not realizing it. Then when you first learn about patterns, oh my god, patterns everywhere. Pattern explosion. Singleton, singleton. Singleton. Yeah. <laughs> 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 using singleton, I'll stab <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's 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 very true. And then in the end, after you have you know, pattern explosion, you finally go back to using patterns, not really knowing that you're using patterns, except now you're kind of doing it correctly. Yeah, or or using them intentionally, but in the places yeah. where they're appropriate. I don't even think about I'm using this pattern. I just write the code that is the pattern. It's not like I am going to use this pattern to solve this problem right now. Oh look, there it is. There's the pattern. Just solve the problem. It's the pattern. Yeah. So. Um, to get it. Is somebody grabbing a paper towel or an eraser of some sort? Your mocks your, or your patterns point is a good one here because if you're yeah. familiar with, if you're thinking in patterns, you've got construction and behavior all wrapped all up wrapped in, together. In, in this method. So, yeah. I mean, okay. that's the other smell, but I, I get that the mocks one is easier to identify. Although, don't, with, with patterns, I get a lot of, you know, you have this, the pattern is this, and you're doing that. Um, I, I actually yelled at my boss for about 45 minutes a lot of people say, oh, this is the pattern. You're doing the pattern wrong. No, you're, no, <laughs> just it's a patterns are guidelines. It's more of a guideline. And I feel like anybody who says you're doing the pattern wrong, unless you're applying, unless you say the pattern is named this and it's actually something totally different, I feel like there is no doing it wrong. There's using a guideline and making it work. There's the spirit of the pattern. I want to play devil's advocate for one yeah. moment before you completely abandon the last sure. 
Um, so I want to go back to the question of love, because um, I had my thinking challenged at one point. So I was once working on a project that had some code like that in it that I had written, I came back to it months later, and I was embarrassed. And I went to the project owner and said, and said I need, I'm going to spend some time fixing this code. And he said, wait, wait. And he looked, he, he did get what the law said, we have not touched this file in the last two years, and it works. It works with zero bugs reported to this. Do not touch it. Yep, I totally agree. So, so even though the design is bad, and even though there's a design smell, I still want to call it a bug until it's like it's like it's not a bug until it's observed, right? It's a it's a dead cat in a box, maybe or not. <laughs> but well, but there's still the notion of bug factories. Like if you leave, if you pour honey on your kitchen counter and you go to sleep, you might not get ants. But you still can't say that that's a good anti-ant strategy. To <laughs> well, fair, so fair. But I guess the thing is, is, is in its mission of tracing back the ants to that honey, because there may be there may be honey in a jar that you think would be bringing ants to. And it, there right? are no ants in the Antarctic. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, are you, are you changing that? It working? Yeah. Well, and that's, and that's the difference between design bug and a coding bug. We just feed that. You know, well, it, yes, yes, it's, <laughs> yes, it's a design problem. But if it's not generating any issues, so. Yeah, all that matters is whether it's a defect, uh, whether it's whether it's a problem, um, and it could generate a problem for a customer, and that causes them to go WTF to your software. It could cause a problem to another developer. They come into it and go WTF, and it takes them four hours to figure out the code so that they can make their next change to it. That's a cost. Okay. It could, it could be difficult to adapt to new requirements. It could have all sorts of different things. Or that one um, thing could be that one object, yeah. which you never change it because you're afraid to touch it. But everywhere else in the code, you've got interfaces surrounding wrappers, you've got adapters, you've got decorators, you've got a zillion yeah. things that are designed to just kind of put that up into a corner and it just but, deletes it. Yeah. But, so but, but all the other things are checked by swear words. Yeah. If you yeah. 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 think what are people swearing at or going, oh yeah, that. If well, nobody was swearing at it, nobody was right. going, oh yeah, that, nobody touched yeah. it. It's not your highest priority thing to change. Churn on the files, though, I can see that too with churn. I mean, that's one thing I ask my students. You know, we're talking about churn, they're like, oh, what that is. And I'm like, okay, who has a file called gamelogic.cpp? About half the class will raise their hand. Like, who has a bug in that once per day? Same people. You know, who changes that file every 20 minutes? On, yeah, they all, there's that one file. Yeah. And I've, I've used churn as a metric of this is not good very effectively in the past. Yeah. And, and don't just churn, please just. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, but the, it is very true what you were, were talking about. Not all code needs to change, um, and not all ugly code needs to change. Um, in fact, I still write a lot of procedural code in big chunks of my systems because it's the fastest, easiest way to get this part of the job done. And this part of the job really is just do a bunch of things in order. Great, let's do a bunch of things in order, <laughs> right? Exactly. And that's a design no problem. problem. That's a design problem. I'm not saying you should change it. What you're doing sounds fine, but well, that's a design problem. It's not. It's not a coding problem. Actually, I would say that's not even a problem, right? That's choose. I chose the right design for the job. For the job, there. I chose. I chose to, you know, when I had to do 60 different things in a sequence, and it's just execute a bunch of stuff. I could have extracted a, a monad of function pointers that I would dispatch to. <laughs> Or I could just write 50 calls, right? <laughs> um, Which is why it's not a coding problem. Yeah, I would say, and it's not a design problem either. It's a, it's a fine design. Uh, it's not a problem. Um, and likewise, especially often. But you've got weaknesses go. there if your requirements. I'm not saying you should change if that. If my requirements. Thing, but you've got weaknesses if your requirements change. And isn't that what Agile is all about? Requirements change, and now I've got this thing that's a mess that I can't. And I can't unit test it effectively. Uh, well, so okay, Yagni, I'm going to call Yagni on that because you're saying here's the initialization code, and we have to initialize 15 different systems and their things, and then the whole application just uses that. And you want to refactor it because it's going to change somewhere. Okay, maybe it is, but just ignore it until then. Yeah, yeah. and when it does, I'll add another one to the end. Which um, is why it's a design I do thing. Want to put, a, a, maybe right. I can't call it a problem, but. That's why it's part of design. That's why I think we agree there's no silver bullet. It's no silver forward. bullet. We can move forward. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good call. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. So let's let's go back to, to this previous example. Um, what is roughly the design the way that we think of it for for that example? You know, design or lack thereof. There was an interface that had um, a, the real loader and some sort of a mock 
and then we had another interface of a real, I don't know, whatever it was, a project file, um, and another mod. And there are, and we think of it, and we draw the design. We've got boxes and inheritance diagrams. If, if you think it nouns, though, if you think in verbs, like I was, I was thinking more of the verbs, not the nouns. Yeah, yeah. So if you do a functional, functional design, and you start thinking in verbs, it will look very different. Um, and that's part of where I'm going with this, actually, is a lot of us draw this when, we, when we're thinking of our design. Okay? And our, in our previous system, we would have drawn something like this. There's a bunch of boxes, and there's, there's nouns in there. What's the computer do? It thinks in verbs. Right? So it has a function, which it pushes some stuff onto a stack frame. That stuff on a stack frame starts to execute the command uh, interpreter, pushing more stuff onto a stack frame pushing more stuff that allocates an object, returns that, pulls these off. Pushes more stuff onto a stack frame, doing something with these project things. Pulls that one off, then it executes the execute function, pulls that one off, pulls this one off, pushes more things onto a stack frame. What do we have here? We've got some execution tree. So when we're looking at testing, are we testing this or are we testing this? Testing that. We're testing this. Everyone thinks they're testing this and they write tests around this. And they call it, this is the test for the foo method on the load. But the computer is doing this. And at, when we're at the low level, the foo test, the foo method on load on the loader is one of those units. Great. So testing this and testing this are identical. No impedance mismatch. What happens when we're testing this function? think we're testing this, we're actually testing this tree. Impedance mismatch. And that's where we start having to put mocks for all of these things, and we're trying to stub out and limit the tree that we're executing so that we execute just that portion that we want to. So what if, instead of thinking of our tests in terms of this, we start thinking of our tests in terms of that? This is OO. This is functional or procedural, <laughs> depending on how you decompose and how you write. <laughs> but, um, but in particular, this is following thinking about the execution model. So, as long as we're looking, we're thinking only in a OO space. What are the ways that I can snip off a bit of this tree? I can go fake. What other options do I have? It's a fake. Yeah, I can give a fake of some sort. I can give another object. What else do I have? Take the tree apart into smaller trees. Yeah, you're creating a whole tree. Maybe I can find a way to take it into smaller trees. And in particular, a common way to do that is um, I'll have this one and I'll have another tree over here, and they'll come together here, and I'll just say, I'm not going to test this part, and I'll test both of those subtrees. And we'll leave this one untested. Do you, do you distinguish between mocks and a dependency injection approach where, where the objects themselves are configured by dependencies and therefore they know how to be tested? Um, any of those, you're, you're replacing the object with another object. Whether I have to explicitly tell it to you or whether you're magic and smart, um, both of those give me troubles. Right? <laughs> both of those give me nightmares as a legacy coder. But yeah, I spend a lot of my time fixing legacy code. Um, and so, yeah, both of those give me nightmares when I talk about our code base. Yes, so that, that's absolutely one. This branch here was just to give me a result. What if I just change this tree to look like that? Now I can test this by itself and this by itself. And there, I've decomposed the problem. Yeah. That's delegation. 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 Yeah, so a delegate. There we go. That's another option. Well, and that one example would be like passing the project name instead of literally. Yeah, and here it would be passing the project the project name. But but if we took, for example, the one of reading config file setup, maybe I pass in a lambda, which, which you give a string, and it gives you back a string. And when I initialize it, and when I uh, initialize it with the real one, I pass it config reader dot get value. And that's what it is in the real code. But in my test, 
It's just a lambda that gets a string and it <laughs> gives one back. Right? That's a mock. Yeah. That's, that is a mock, but it's a mock that it's of a different. It's it's a it's a different kind of fake because I can make I'm making a higher order function there which has very different behaviors and expectations. Okay. I feel like fundamentally what you're doing here, I, I think I see your comments now. Um, with the code sample you had before, you're passing a bunch of stuff into the function that you think you will need, and therefore you have to end up mocking it out. And you're not taking a look at what does this actually need? What's the minimum set of things this function needs in order for it to live? It only needs the project name. It only needs the actual command. And so instead of what's what's the actual just those, what, what's the smallest subset of, of things you're passing into this you can get away with? Yeah, so the first, the first step, yes, the best way to remove a dependency is to find out you don't actually need the information. Go down to the minimum information you need and you can kill a lot of dependencies. Kill dependencies, you don't need to mock them. Great. Doesn't solve them all. <laughs> I still have some. Um, and so that's where we then start talking about um, degrees of couple. So there are highly coupled things. Two sequential statements. Two statements are in sequence inside a function. Those two are highly coupled with each other. That's the, the coupling that I'm going to go from one to the next is determined at pile time, and there's nothing I can do about it. Um, <laughs> 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 uh, I can do it around a couple of places, like where there's a call. But um, if I do an iter uh, you know, with operator overloading, I can do even more. But <laughs> you know, there's still lists I can't touch again. No, no, okay. Okay. All right. So, so that's all the way up at the top. There's a variety of things here. Um, somewhere in the middle, I just put a dead center in the middle. Um, it's a V table call. Basically, what we're doing in OO. Right. So, for whatever in whatever way that I'm representing it, I'm handing you a pointer to a V table. You're dereferencing that pointer. You're adding some offset. You're dereferencing that object, and you're executing whatever the heck you find there. Now, at that point, I don't have a compile time uh, uh, dependency. I already have a link time dependency. But I have encoded in the call site that I'm going to do two D references at exactly what the offset I'm going to want. So I've limited the scope of what I can pass in. A function pointer is a lower degree of coupling. Because I'm going to hand you a pointer. You're just going to dereference it and call whatever I gave you to. So I don't have to set up as much stuff around there. There aren't as many constraints on what I can get to. So yes, a lambda is still a fake. But a lambda is a fake for a point that has a significantly lower degree of coupling. I can give it many more options much more easily. Just because you didn't give it a name? Um, because I'm not expecting it to be an instance of a type. I'm Sorry. expecting it to be a function point. Right. And you can substitute that at test time without the rest of the code having to be impacted, right? Right. I can substitute that in all sorts of ways without impacting the rest of the code. And there's something, something implicit here, too, that may not be catching, which is that if you're reducing the surface area of your function, so they have fewer arguments coming in, the, arc, the function you're passing in as a fake is going to be smaller itself as well. So there's this right. cyclical effect of everything gets smaller. Everything gets smaller. smaller. Because if you have a function like that check function initially there, Mocking that function <laughs> <laughs> would be <laughs> problematic, right? Yeah. Um, so, so I, so, well, at the same time, though, yeah. you want to maintain expressiveness in your code. Yes. I mean, like, we could say, why don't we just pass in bits? Right? And that's completely decoupled, right? So, <laughs> if there is a balance there. You want, to, you want your code to sort of express the problem as much as possible. You start you know, just passing in focus or whatever. It is losing a little bit of that expressiveness. So, uh, I feel like there's still a balance there. I think one of the ways I've used this in, in keeping expressiveness is that tree that he's showing you, that you push all this stuff onto the stack, those are actually values with a name. And so you don't just have a function that accepts a string, you have a function that accepts something and returns something. Yeah. Yeah, so, so especially if I've got a, a good type system that I'm working with, especially if I have one that allows me to, I don't know, clone a type and have it have the same implementation as the previous type, but be different in terms of the compiler's needs, like, I don't know, Haskell. Um, then, <laughs> then I can do a lot of those things. And I can say, this isn't a string. This is a name. It's implemented as a string, and it has all the stringy behaviors, but it's a name. It's different. 
Um, and so yeah, then, then I get a lot of that power without having to pay the cost. Can we rewrite the function, or is this maybe jump too far ahead, in order to show that it would be more, it would be equally as expressive, uh, that first example? Um, we could rewrite it, uh, yeah, at some point, uh, variations on it. Um, I think that we can, you know, once we get through the end of probably several different changes that we're going to want to make to this thing, and, and we'll see how expressive it is. Also, that happens to be one that I have in a blog post, so you can see the way that I rewrote it. <laughs> okay, yeah. I will add that a lot. Yeah, it builds out of the fast and then uh, uh, function pointer or a lambda or, or whatever. It seems like when you do that, suddenly you start to invite a lot of code duplication. Because I'll have, well, in this case, I need to do this thing. In this other case, I want to do most of it. And I can't just pull those into an object now, so I'm just saying it's with the bracket, here's a bunch of stuff, and it's with the bracket. And then Next time I have to do that, oh, well, this one's a little bit different. It's really rapid, copy, paste, delete, so delete, change. So if that were true, then functional programming programs would always be larger for a given problem solved the problem than OO programs, wouldn't they? Uh, necessarily. Uh, functional uh, It's even going to depend on, on how you're doing it, but what I see here is, is the invitation to create kind of unintentional work or just code duplication in general. Yes. So there's always a chance to create code duplication, regardless of what techniques I use or I'm not using. Right. With the interface, <laughs> I, can, I can force you into this object and make you implement this interface, and you can't just type a swiggly graph and do whatever the hell you want anymore. It's a whole lot more work if you want to suddenly duplicate. Yeah. Okay. So if, so if you don't trust me and you want to eliminate the amount of duplication that I write, that can be a way to place a constraint on me. You're, anything with a higher degree of coupling, you're placing more constraints on me. If you do trust me and you want to give me more ability to optimize my use of your system and to decrease the total use of the system, then you probably want to move to something where you give me more options. Right? Because, for example, if I've got, if your thing takes a delegate, if your thing takes an interface, I have to implement the whole interface. I only, you were only going to call two functions on this thing and I didn't actually pass this object to anything else you were going to use. So I implemented six functions, two of which you're going to use. Right. Well, then you have a problem with the client, though, you're violating interface integration. The interface is just wrong if you're not doing all that. That's a different things. problem. So. However, when you get to APIs, I, interface segregation runs into uh, API simplification. I want you to be able to define a noun. I want you to be able to say, I'm creating a, I don't know, an eye clock, and it has clock-like behaviors, right? Um, and you want to put all of the clock-like behaviors together. And I want to give you, here's what it means to be a clock at an API level for a library. And yeah, that doesn't have good interface segregation. Right? Um, but if, I, if my API happens to be written more to take functions, um, and it's, there's a get time, you know, give me a time giver. Right? Um, it's a different style. And as, as whoever was in the back was saying, uh, there's a challenge to expressiveness. There is a challenge to expressiveness with any style when working with people who are used to a different style. Expressiveness is contextual. You're expressive to a particular audience. If I wrote OO code and handed it to a guy who had been programming Haskell for the last seven years, he would not be able to figure it out very well. Certainly not as well as if I just handed him a couple of simple monads. <laughs> <laughs> Might be backwards for some of the other people in this room. <laughs> so, so I want to I want to I want to ask this question or, or another challenge of thinking. We all think code duplication is evil mm -hmm. and bad, but I've seen an an anti pattern, which is where we in our zeal to remove code duplication actually see two things that are similar and we combine implementation and then we proliferate complexity inside that with little tiny side cases and then it should have been separate and they look a lot alike. They look like just alike maybe. But so I I things that are code identical but semantically different. Exactly. And so over time they vary in different ways. Exactly. And it, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Very common problem. Or they're code identical but they're behaviorally different. Mm -hmm. Which is you're you're causing false overlap. You're you're not dividing up your testing based on behavior, but rather I'm going to take the code closely. Right. But it's a difference between duplication and redundancy. Duplication is the same thing. Redundancy is the thing for the same reason. And it's the thing for the same reason that causes the problem. Right. In fact, you can have redundancy without code duplication. Yes. You can have two totally different pieces of code that do the same thing for the same reason, and it's redundant. That, that's when you get it. Yeah. Yeah. Duplication is a, an easy way to detect redundancy. If you it's a smell for redundancy it. Filter. Redundancy filter, yeah. But yeah. yes, no. redundancy is the problem. Duplication is the problem. 
Okay, um, so we talked about a couple of ways to, to simplify, well, to change the code um, and decrease the level of coupling. Um, I want to step sideways a little bit. I want to talk about places where mocks are good. Places where even I would say mocks are absolutely the right solution to the problem. So to clarify, you're talking about object fakes. Object fakes. Yeah. Object fakes. The things that you would get out of a, a test double OO framework or thinking like that. Um, and in a sense, I will actually even call, I, maybe we'll get there later. I would consider, like like uh, he was saying, um, function pointers, yeah, they're still still fakes, and a lambda is still a fake. There's a better design. Um, often there is a better design. Like, pass in the result rather than the function um, is a way to eliminate that one, too. You know? So even those, you know, if I have this sort of a, a code coupling, I'm going to look for a less coupled solution. If I have this sort, I'm going to look for a less coupled until I run into expressiveness or you know, that, that there's no responsibilities left in the code or other sorts of smells. Um, but let's talk about object mocks in particular. Um, what are some of the places where um, fakes, test doubles, mocks, I'm not distinguishing, are useful? Well, for actually mocks in particular, uh, a mock, one thing I like about most mock frameworks, I'm able to assert that a particular behavior did not occur and say explicitly, you did not do this in code. I'm saying, here is something that should be cached or lazy loaded or something like that. I want to test this. I want to make sure this object did not go actually reload that code. It should have used whatever it was storing or something like that. So that's a place where really I almost would say mocks are required. I could code a fake for that, but why? Just use mock. Yeah, I mean, I, I can pass in the, the a function that just stores whether it was called and get the same result. Yeah, but mock gives me that one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. External service or physical system? Physical system? By the way, I'll probably disagree with that. We'll talk about that later. Uh, next one. External <laughs> services. Right, and external services. Yeah, well, same thing. Someone else's API. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, some of but I'm dealing with someone else's code. code. <laughs> <laughs> what I learned about um, hard way, one of my rules of programming is thou shalt not mock a data reader. I do that one time. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. Your code. <laughs> <laughs> My code is good. Your code will be mocked. <laughs> <laughs> to break a dependency on something which will make the test too slow. Aha. Uh -huh. Slow stuff. Okay. <laughs> uh, I might disagree on some of those too. We'll see. Okay. Operating system. I'm going to put that in the same category up here. Right. This is a pretty broad category of, and in fact, even the slow stuff is probably that same category. A little different, but it's the same rough. Okay. Say something that's kind of fundamentally untestable in terms of automated fashion. Like, is the dragon on the screen flapping its wings in a realistic manner? And a mock that's on that? <laughs> no, nothing. Important. What I would do is just have whatever that. I can't actually detect it. I can't assume that. So, so I we used have to, yeah, something I that just tells me the answer to that. When, when I was in the games industry, we called those the funness tests. Yes. That's, yeah. Is this game fun? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. How about something that's not built yet? So if you program me by attention. Uh -huh. Something that has to be built yet. Yeah. That's a good one. Missing stuff. Probably say no on that one too, but <laughs> but yeah, that's a common one. Yeah. I'm just trying to think. Uh, sometimes I want to test sequence, so if I'm doing two phase commit, it's sort of important that you do both reserves before either commits. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. There's a couple of big. What was that? Yeah, you did index. Um, yeah, sequence is similar. I'll, I'll, I agree with that. Um, I could I could say any sequences. You didn't do X before you did Y. Yeah, <laughs> I agree with that. Yeah. Uh, okay. So there's a couple of big categories that we're missing. Okay, I'm 
screen, would you put failure up on that second line too? Mm -hmm. Like a failure of an external. Like, it's a subcategory of an external so it's a system, but a fail of that. Like, like, Checking for fail, yeah. check for, for response yeah. to a failure. Like yeah. Fault injection or, or fault this, injection? This, this, okay, fault injection. I'm going to absolutely disagree with, but I'm going to put it up here. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anything that can spit out randomness or non-determinism, like if you've got a, a counter or you've got a do it, do it. A clock. Yeah. Okay. Which is what I meant by physical. Yeah, okay. okay, I would agree with that and I would put it up here. So non deterministic. Yeah. So that's an easy category to fill. Yeah, so there's a lot of things in this in this category. In fact, this is one of the most common ones that, that people point to. The things that are an external system, a slow dependency, and something non deterministic. That, I, that category I consider anything that violates the rules I think of in my unit test suite. Tests shall not be slow, they shall not be random, they shall not be, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So anything that violates that, that's this category. Um, yeah. What if you're trying to uh, design something and you don't really truly understand what dependencies are yet? And so you use a mock as kind of an exploratory, easy way to change your interface or refactor something without having to break a whole bunch of other code and then try to simplify and just kind of just have something that you can just start calling code against. And then as you start to understand what it's doing, you can well, get rid of this. Some sort of a design dummy? Yeah. Yeah. Missing stuff. Missing stuff. I, yeah, that's probably the missing stuff. Uh, I, I don't think it is missing necessarily. If, if I'm missing something, it means I have a thing and don't know, and I am not able to use it like an API or a library. No, no, what she, was meaning, what she was saying is things that I haven't, I'm using code by intention, so I haven't written the code for that yet. I don't know what it is. Okay, so I think that is the same thing. Okay, so there's a big category here. What are you trying to call? Six letters long. Starts with an L. Uh, Legacy. That's your code. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a difference, though. Legacy, I'm thinking, this is now my code. It sucks to be me. <laughs> it was at one point your code, it's now mine. <laughs> so. Exactly. Yep, exactly. So that, that's a circumstance where mocks are very handy. So, so frameworks then, another category then, or do that mean your code or like um, Frameworks I would put next to, okay. next to your code. Um, well, code. when you, you need to call, that, even an external service, but you need to call some things in sequence, for example, or several interactions with one object. Several interactions with one object? If it's a normal object, Mocks are not appropriate for that. If it's a uh, one of these, I think we've already got it. I, I have to object to one thing: external service in the physical non deterministic system, because that's not what I meant by it. I meant to have by an external service something that either costs me money, or operates on live data, or is uh, has side effects that I do not wish to produce, like posting on somebody's Facebook page yeah. or sending. So, so I hear what you're saying there, but for me, what I'm, what the reason I'm lumping those all together is I'm saying that anything which violates one of the rules of unit you know, testing, and so posting on someone's Facebook page violates the rules of my unit tests. My unit tests shall not do that. My unit tests shall not depend on a platform specific. So platform dependencies fall into that category, right? Um, any of these sorts of things. So I'm going to put back the external service. Um, and I'm going to put on platform. All of those are certainly things that I don't want my inner test to be doing. I need to find some way to not do it. Okay, but the question is whether they use mocks or The external system mostly has to do with outputs and generating effects that I don't want, whereas the physical system has to do with Inputs that are reproducible and cover all cases. They're, they're not the same thing, but the, the testing implications are the same. Yeah. The test, so, any, any time, so, um, so there are two different architectures out there um, that are sort of the extreme of this, this spectrum. There's tell don't ask, and there's uh, pure function. Right. So, a pure function, um, every function 
um, only operates on the values that it's given. It gives a return object. Doesn't have side effects. No side effects at all. Okay. In tow mode ask, everything only has side effects. There are no getters anymore. Right. So I am given some data, and when I want to do something, I will call things and send messages. And if I want to get values from you, I will send you a message that says, please tell me something, and then I will wait. And I will hope that you send me a message saying, here's something. Right. So every problem can be transformed from one of these to the other through mathematical rules. And therefore, from the, and that's why the testing implications of these systems are actually identical. Whether it's a push or a pull, in a sense, it's information moving in or out of my system. And what I'm trying to do is alter the way that information is getting in and out of the system under test without having it go to the regular way. All that I care about is whether I'm drawing a boundary. Now, the techniques that I'm going to use for that do vary depending on which, whether it's a push or a pull. Um, mocks are often used for both. There are other techniques that only work for one or the other. Um, so, so okay. So here are a bunch of these are a bunch of, ex of examples of places. So why are these the examples that people use mocks? <coughs> what is the purpose of a mock? Test double. Stand in a place for something else. You said test, it's a test double. double. Test double. Okay. Okay. So what's the purpose for a test double? Just to isolate. 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 To give them the value. To bring things which are in scope, but which you're not testing right now, under the control of the test. To bring things which are in scope, but you aren't testing right now, under control of the test. To comply your tests. To get the tests to compile. <laughs> <laughs> cover all possible inputs. So, thinking broader, the purpose of a mock, what is it? Remove a boundary. To remove a, remove a boundary. Remove a boundary? What's that? Plus, that's the more of the flow and not necessarily the behavior that you are testing double you're bringing it as double one. Testing the flow of use of a thing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's a word, <coughs> one word in there that I like. Yeah. Let me temporarily avoid something you don't like. Let me temporarily avoid something you don't like. There's another word in that that I like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? Cut the dependency graph. Cut the dependency graph. Yeah. So the way I think of it, um, taking words from each of those, is to temporarily take code which is tightly connected and pretend under a test that it is not connected, but I've cut the ground. Now you've got, yeah. <laughs> so mocks, you did, the yeah. power of mocks are that I can take highly coupled code and pretend it isn't. <laughs> That is a beautiful, powerful tool. There are tons of places that belongs. Why do I use that in legacy code? Duh. <laughs> it's highly coupled. I don't want to touch it yet and make it decoupled, but I want to start putting boundaries under it and getting some things so that I can start touching it. I want to pretend it isn't coupled. Box, wonderful solution. Okay. Why do a lot of people use that for physical systems? I'm tightly coupled to the physical system. I've got direct bindings to it. I want to pretend that I wasn't. So I'm going to put a mock in and a fake for it. Okay. Well, you have to use a function for that. A lot of things can be used for that. But the advantage, one of the nice advantages of mocks are um, object mocks and, and even a lot of these. Um, assume that the code is using the normal-ish call things that your code, that your language supports. So. Um, if I'm in an OO language, I assume that you're doing a bunch of object uh, method calls on objects, right? So mocks allow me to intercept method calls on objects, which are a very high degree of coupling. And I can pretend that they're totally decoupled and rewrite those to wherever the heck I want. Right? If I'm in a functional programming language, then the normal thing is I give you a function, a, a function object, and you dereference and call it. And so I'm giving you a fake one of those, and I can 
set you off wherever I want to set you off. Um, so all of these are places where you have a high degree of coupling in language normal use, and I want to pretend that it isn't coupled. So mocks are only useful when you have code that's improperly coupled. Well, it's not a coupling, you have yeah. a choice for it. Mocks are, mocks are primarily useful in code that is improperly coupled, that is overcoupled. Uh, there are other solutions, right? I can decrease the coupling to make it more appropriately coupled. Right. And when I do that, do I need a mock anymore? What did I do when I extracted that piece of code that was making an object call to get the through a through an interface to, to get the arguments and just passed in the value of the arguments? I want to characterize an object. So I want to know, you know, all about its behavior and what it gives me when you put this in, you get that out. And I can construct that with interfaces, and it just seems natural to test it with mocks. Yeah. Um, that's not necessarily on, improperly I mean, uh, I, Well, a lot of it depends on, on what the system is doing. So if I'm if I'm not doing a telltale task architecture, if I'm doing a more common OO architecture, okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave telltale task aside because. Uh, I have a couple code is supposed to be coupled in particular ways in that, so it's you know <laughs> it's fun and interesting, but it's different. Um, so in in most normal code, um, if I have an interface and it's got a bunch of methods that take some arguments and return void, modifying the state of the object, those are hard to test, and I need mocks in order to be able to inject values and be able to look at things and all that sort of stuff. If I've got a whole lot of methods that take an object. Object, if I can set up an object with a known state by construction, and I've got a whole bunch of objects that return their values, I don't need mocks to test that anymore. I've eliminated most of those coupling dependencies and said that now, now this method is tightly coupled to the state of the object. The state of the object is decoupled from everything else because I can just set it to an arbitrary state by construction. Um, and this this method is decoupled from any state other than the state of this object, and it gives me my value back as something which is separate from the object. At that point, real easy to test. It is no more or less an OO design. It's a different OO design that is less coupled. One of the things that you, or you asked the question, what did you do when you pulled it out? One of the things you did was flatten the method and then you expanded it out. But at the top, There can be, there can be, um, and any of the techniques like they, this, this when I am doing it on code, it definitely feels like I keep pushing the intelligence away, um, and then I find that there's no intelligence left in the system, and I can scratch yeah, it. Yeah, like it works. <laughs> 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 or else I find that I, I keep uh, you know I, I push intelligence down to various pieces, and there's some controller layer up at the top, and I get to the controller layer up at the top, and it's just saying. I set up all the system and I tell the people to go. Right. Okay, and then I test that it sets the system up, right? Uh, but it's it's often often that. Yeah, uh, it feels like you're eliminating a lot of reasonable design. What is reasonable? Yeah. <laughs> does it solve the problem? Does it does it behave to spec? Absolutely. There are absolutely. And that's what I'm saying. I'm saying that there'd be a lot of designs that would not fit your criteria. Because my, because my criteria are higher than does it behave to spec. There are a bajillion designs which behave to spec. Remember from, I don't know, 45 minutes ago, it's the job of a programmer to do the work and to prove that the work is right. My design not only needs to be, to do the behavior, but I need to be able to quickly and easily and legitimately prove that it does the behavior to whatever level of proof I can generate. And I should get better and better at my level of proof over time. Yeah. That which I can prove next uh, this year should be obvious next year, and I should prove more. What's wrong with proving that with mocks? I can prove it with mocks. Well, but you said, I'm just um, trying to so follow the often, logic. So like often, often um, with mocks, you will have, there's a, there's a redundancy problem that, that makes proof hard that makes the uh, integration test a problem. So assume I've got two objects that are mutually, they're codependent. Okay. Because this happens all the time. 
even in decent designs. Yeah. So, how do I test this one? I give it a mock for that. How do I test this one? I give it a mock of that. Now, those tests, what is the behavior that is locked into each one of those tests? The test for this guy is defining the behavior for this guy and a subset of the behavior for this guy and vice versa. The test for this one is only valid if the portion of the behavior that this is providing in its mock for that happens to match the behavior that this test is testing that the real of that does. And there's no part of my system that is able to prove those two are identical. So I get an integration bug here because I've got two fully tested things, tested in isolation, both doing exactly what I said they would do, and I just said that they would do slightly different things. I didn't notice it. And people who do lots of systems with lots and lots of mocks often run into exactly that problem with integration bugs, especially the first time I refactor. Because I refactor, I update this guy's, the tests for this guy, and I find 9 out of 10 of the tests that have a dependency on it, and I miss one, and all of my tests pass. One of the things, one of the things that I find also with especially if you have uh, a language of pattern matching or right. any of the thing that can well, take advantage of I mean, doing I've, that. I've just been doing it in C-sharp. I didn't do a subtype, you know, on the uh, class, and then I, I just have to switch on it and say, is it this or is that? I don't get the proof from just the pilot. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's I'm handling all the cases. But at least can, uh, without having a bunch of methods and other properties changing the state, I can actually represent concepts in the domain in types of names yeah. instead of, instead of uh, objects. Right, and if I want the compiler to check, then I can use visitor pattern or something like that and get compiler checking on top of it. But right. it's a trade-off. It's an engineering right, exactly. trade-off. Because once you start using the visitor pattern, you're not going to control it. Yeah. Getting the compiler to Kind of jump on that. Let's jump over the world of C so you can kind of compiler verify that for you. What about the meta program? What about having false classes and type traits and stuff like that? Because then, if I do something bad, the compiler will give me a cryptic error message, but I get the most rapid feedback of all. My code does not compile because I screwed something up. My code is wrong. Yeah, I had a system a long time ago that we were using uh, a lot of template meta programming in C. Um, and using the volatile keyword correctly, we were right. able to have the compiler check for deadlocks. Microsoft did find the volatile means so it's not correct on that way. Well, okay. This was this was in 2000, uh, long before I worked at Microsoft. So, <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can, in some languages, you need a compiler check quite a lot for you. Haskell is famous for that. Um, uh, in other languages, not so much. JavaScript compiler will not check a whole lot of things for you. <laughs> It'll let you do what you want to do, or what you told it you wanted to do. <laughs> okay. um, so this, going back to this statement, that's the way I think of mocks. So now, where are mocks good, if we're thinking of, the, of mocks that way, and where are they not good? In a, number of, in a couple of these places, legacy, that is exactly the behavior that I want. Right? I want to pretend this code was less coupled than it is. In some of these places, like um, another one that we didn't write down is with a team that is that is only, that has learned some about unit testing and the like and hasn't learned a lot. They don't have enough, a lot of design techniques available. They're still trying to figure out what units are and how to program units as opposed to big masses. They're just trying to learn what solid is. Absolutely. They're going to write highly coupled code. If I can give them a way that they can pretend it isn't, 
then they can start getting a sense for, oh, yeah, I'm pretending that this wasn't coupled and this is what it looks like. I, I, I can start learning and building on that knowledge. Right? And soon I can start writing code that doesn't need the mocks in order to look that way. So that's another great time to use it. And by the way, the, the time period between I am getting started and I, I want to, I need to start figuring out how to test in units as opposed to these big integration tests and I can actually write most any problem without needing a mock. You know, that's <coughs> three to five years. Um, so, <laughs> so we're not talking newbies here, we're talking lots of devs. <laughs> um, so those are some great examples of times that or sometimes that I don't want. What's what's the problem with something that fundamentally gives me that? The code is highly coupled. The code remains highly coupled. And talking about tests as design feedback. Design is not good. I've just put in a palette of cure. It's just cured all my pain without changing the problem. So I've missed feedback. Yeah. I was gonna say pretend is kind of a Keyword there. <laughs> 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 yes. Because something could happen in the real world that you didn't anticipate, and you're like, "Well, the test passed, but things are still screwed up." Yeah. So it's it's decoupled from reality. It is decoupled from reality. It's so hard to refactor. It can be very hard to refactor because yeah, there's no test has 20 lines of set up. Yeah. Oh. Well, and this is in fact a perfect example of code which is not duplicate, but is redundant. Right. That mock is redundant with the other specification and with the code that meets the specification, even though it's a totally different set of code. Makes it pain to refactor. Or, well, refactoring still might not be a problem, but changing the behavior intentionally is. <laughs> it's also very difficult to read for something coming into the new. What's a, mock, what's a mock and what's a real? Especially yeah. when they have the same name. It, it really can be, yeah. Depending on how you're writing it and how you're using it, um, there are great ways to use mock frameworks that don't have legibility problems, and then there's all the others. <laughs> <laughs> every mock framework is different, and you know how do I how do I read this? Because every test has you know, 20 lines set up. I just want to write a test. I don't want to learn how to write a test. Yeah, when I have to put the slash, the comment, arrange, and then act, you know that that's a clue. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we've talked some about some of the techniques that can be used to solve some of these problems. We haven't talked about others. Um, so uh, like that one, there's a whole talk that I can give that's about 15 minutes long called Angry Hexagon um, that is all about alternatives to mocking for solving this category of problems, dependent systems and hard dependencies. One of the key aspects of, of that talk though is the first, in the first 15 seconds where I say, this is to solve the little, the one percent problems on the edge. Okay. First, you solve the ninety-nine percent of your problems in the middle, where you didn't have this problem, um, and you don't need mocks for that. You just do good designs, and you know you do whatever's appropriate for there. This is useful. This is a category of problems. It's something you have to solve, but it's something that is should be just the boundary of your system. If it's not, refactor it. Push those things to the boundary. <laughs> Encapsulate those dependencies. Um, but yeah, so that's that's one that we won't have time because we're about to run out of time and need to get beer. Yeah. What if you can't can push those to the boundary? I just had a flashback from the graphics engine that I'm working on and shader compilation. And oh my god, dynamic shader defenses. It took me a year, actually a year, yeah. to kind of come up with a half ass so, design. So there are domains in which perf or stress or load or async behavior or something else will prevent you from using the design that you want to use. And then life will suck. Um, and there are better, there are better and worse design options at that point. But anytime you get to the circumstance where all of the designs that you would like to use and would be easy to change are prohibited by some constraint that you have to meet, okay, you can't use a design that's easy to change. Um, those do happen. Fortunately, those point. don't happen very often. Yeah, that was my point. Yeah. yeah, but they don't happen very often. Um, you know, if, if I do, uh, you know, most any system, I put it under perf, I put it under the, the load, I look at the, the problems, there will be some hot spots, I clean up those hot spots, and I'm good enough. And it works. 
the systems where I am trying to push the boundary of hardware science today, um, which there are a small number of people doing, but there are some people doing, um, okay, that I might clean up the hot spots and get down to, all right, now the problem is physics. Uh, no. Work around no. that, bitch. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I was talking. I was talking with some people where they said, "Yeah, we got it to the point where fundamentally the problem was the speed of light between these two points was too damn slow. <laughs> <laughs> we needed to move information at about 2.3 c. <laughs> it's an interesting option." Um, <laughs> But it's impossible to do with, with anything like a good design. You're going to be having to optimize the crud out of every single cycle in order to get there. And when you get there, you put whatever abstractions you can around it. You give yourself as many signposts as you can. You test as much as you can. And you have these long lumps of code that are just, you know. Just throw a macro around it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best solution. Macros are often a. I, I often used to say solution. macros are always bad, and there's just simply well, some code that should never see the light of day. Well, and, no and I've seen also a, a common solution is you throw a video around it. Um, you, uh, you write the code, you have the engineer write the code, you get it right, you test it like hell, you make it right, and then once you've got that, you have the two engineers who are working on it, they stand up and they whiteboard in front of a video camera for 25 minutes so they've explained everything. And then you put the URL of that video right in front of that code. And you say, you do not touch this until you watch the whole dang video. Yeah, so it's one level up because because the truth is sometime after that person leaves, you're going to have to touch it. Okay, well what can I do to at least make it as safe as possible? So so yeah, I mean there are a bunch of different solutions for a bunch of different problems. Uh, the general solution, you know, there isn't a general solution. Mocks are a brilliant tool that work because they are a general tool that can solve every problem. The replacement for a mock is not a general tool. There are specific tools for specific cases. Um, if I'm in a language that has good support for asynchronicity, then I can use async dispatch or callbacks to eliminate many, many uses of mocks. If I'm writing you know, that previous, we had that OO code, and we described what the function, what the tree call looks like. That's what it would look like in C Sharp or, or JavaScript or a lot of those sorts of things. What would that look like in Erlang? In Erlang, every one of those is a message pass that might or may not be executed, and if executed, will be executed in a different subprocess. So what that, that tree looks like is this. Parallel, one little d. Easy to test. Different languages have different approaches and make fundamentally different results. So often, one of the ways that you're going to find a good solution is go hunt for it in another language where it's native. <laughs> Let's see what you can bring back. Uh, but, but there isn't going to be a general solution. So what you need to do is continually look for how can I hunt for and find specific solutions for specific cases. This is why I say mocks or smell. Mocks or a smell that I, every time I run into a mock, I go, huh, I have these mocking in here. What else could I do? And I'm creative and I refactor and I try a number of things and I time box it. And if I can't find a solution in 45 minutes, I say, hmm, I have to use a mock here. All right, work. That works, I'm on, right? Just because it's a spell doesn't mean I have to fix it. I, it even doesn't mean it's a problem. And then it's in the back of my mind and then I run into a similar one again and I have another 45 minutes and I can solve it then. And sometime I solve it. And when I find the solution, then I can apply it back. And if, when I'm playing in other languages, I'll be playing with something and I'll, I'll use it and I'll go, this would have solved that problem I had to use a mock for. Because I keep flagging in my brain, when I say mocks or a smell, it's I'm setting a flag on my brain saying, here is an open problem that my design skills are not yet able to handle. And I have the belief that I will, if I am, if I become the god of design and understand all that there is to know about software design, be able to design and test all code without mocks. That's probably a false belief, and it assumes I'll become the god of all code, which is not very likely. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but by having that fallacious belief, 
I can continually improve the sets of design options that are open to me and find more and more cases in which I can test without mocks. And every time I do that, I find it is a way to, instead of pretending that the code is, coupled, is decoupled, actually decouple the code. I absolutely see your point, but I'm confused. Can you give me just a quick description of why legacy and external service are distinct? Um, so uh, external service is someone else's code that I'm not going to change. So my best option is in some way I'm going to, to isolate it. Um, yeah. If it's my external service that I own, then it's two projects and I can take away. Right. Um, so with an external service, I'm assuming that it is someone else's code <laughs> by, at, at the edge. Legacy is mine. I own it. Um, I want to change it. I intend to change it over the next period of time. I can't afford to change it all at once. <laughs> so I need to start getting it under control, start wrapping it up in pieces. You're talking to use so I can mocks, which are a smell, to improve the design of something. Yeah, I can I can put the mocks around it, which allows me to now have a safe space. In which case, I think your goal is to get rid of all. Of them. Eventually, I'll get rid of all of them. Okay. It might take me three years to get rid of all of them, but, but it's a tool to start that process. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you.